Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are truly delighted to have you. Uh, welcome, and uh, thanks again for dedicating that time to be here, to be present with us. Um, once again, good evening, and welcome, everyone, to the Laude Deum Eco Spirituality in Action webinar. Please note that French interpretation will be available throughout the webinar. To navigate to the French channel, please click on the interpretation icon below your screen. Uh, there is also a closed captioning option, which will transcribe uh, the what is being spoken in written language in the same language to you, which could also be found on the list below your screen. So feel free to use the French interpretation or closed captioning if you wish. Um, we're genuinely thrilled to have you uh, and the other participants joining us from coast to coast to coast across what is currently known as Canada. I am Mario Wahba, uh, the Climate Justice Policy Analyst and Communications Coordinator at Citizens for Public Justice, and I have the immense honor of being your host for this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to rightly start by acknowledging the land from which I'm joining you today. Uh, So-called uh, Ottawa, where I'm based, is built on the unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. The Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and we honor their enduring presence and knowledge. I would also wish to acknowledge the land of so-called Vancouver, which has been a significant part of my journey and learning and bonding with this part of Turtle Island. What is currently called Vancouver is situated on the unceded territories of the Musqueam and Squamish peoples, uh, part of the Coast Salish nations. We recognize their enduring relationship with this land, and I express my gratitude for the opportunity to have learned, worked, and grown on their territory. Um, this evening's webinar is made possible through the collaboration of Citizens for Public Justice for the Love of Creation, which is a faith-based coalition for climate justice, and the Galilee Catholic Retreat Center. I sincerely thank all of them uh, and all of our partners was, uh, without whom this work would not have been possible. We're here tonight to explore Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Laudate Deum, or Praise God, and its profound implications for environmental justice and creation care. Your engagement with organizations like ours is vital. It shows elected officials that faith communities are deeply committed to creation care and are ready to take necessary climate actions to address the growing climate crisis. We encourage you to stay connected and engaged with our initiatives, campaigns, and resources. We're also honored and delighted to be joined by an esteemed panel of speakers who will share their insights and wisdom throughout the night. Let me introduce them in the order in which they will speak. First, we have Dane Detloff, who is a research and advocacy officer for development and peace, Caritas Canada, a Catholic movement for international solidarity. His journalism and commentary have featured in Sojourners, America Magazine, uh, Common Wheel, the National Catholic Reporter, G's Magazine, and other outlets. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the Institute for Christian Studies. Thank you for joining us, Dean. And next we'll have Joe Gunn, who has been involved in ecumenical justice work since creation's earliest days as founding vice chair of Kairos, uh, staff of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops and CPJ, and currently serves uh, serving on the advisory circle uh, of the Laudato Si movement and board of the Office of Religious Congregations for Integral Ecology. He is the executive director of Le Center Oblet, a voice for justice located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin peoples at St. Paul University in Ottawa. Thank you for joining us, show. Then we'll uh, be followed by Beth Lormer. Beth is uh, a friend and a colleague and a social and ecological justice advocate with over 15 years of experience in sustainable development. 
She has worked uh, ecumenically with academia, civil society, and government, including global affairs uh, and status of women in uh, Canada. She currently serves as the Ecological Justice Program Coordinator at Kairos Canada and on the Coordinating Committee and Advocacy Committee for the Love of Creation, a Canadian faith-based initiative for climate justice and a partner in this event. Thank you for being here, Beth. Uh, we're also honored to have Agnes Richard, who is working with an advisory circle facing the common good and the Laudato Si movement. Agnes launched a Global Catholic Climate Movement Canada chapter in 2019 and continues as coordinator um, of the movement Laudato Si uh, in Canada. It is a, a nationwide a network of hundreds of Christians focused on raising awareness about Pope Francis's letter to the world Laudato Si on care of our common home and inspiring those who share our faith to act publicly to bring the values of ecological and social justice to life in Canada. She also initiated the Catholic Eco Investment Accelerator Project in 2021 with the help of faith and the common good and the sponsorship of the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. Agnes also co-authored the Catholic Eco Investment Accelerator Toolkit, uh, which is released in 2022, uh, which has gained global recognition. Thank you, Agnes, very much for your contribution. Um, we're also joined by Jerry Kelly. Uh, Jerry is currently the manager of spiritual programs at the Galilee Center in Ontario, Ontario. He has been an advocate and facilitator of intercultural interreligious and interpersonal dialogue and reconciliation for more than 35 years. As director of the Aboriginal Affairs Secretariat at the CCCB, Jerry helped establish the Catholic Aboriginal Council for Reconciliation, now the Canadian Catholic Indigenous Council, to guide the faith community toward a deeper and more just communion. He serves as chair of the Qatari uh, Kateri, sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly, Native Ministry of Ottawa, and is an active member of Our Lady uh, Guadalupe Circle, uh, a Catholic coalition of Indigenous peoples, bishops, clergy, lay movements, etc. And he is the proud father of two adult children and lives uh, with his wife, Gwen Miller, in Ottawa, in the traditional unceded the territories of the Algonquin peoples. Thank you for very much for joining us, uh, Jerry. Last but not least, uh, we have uh, Mireille Church with a background in teaching uh, and HR. Mireille has a great passion for Laudato Si and cyclical for the Laudato Si and cyclical letter of Pope Francis, which reconciles faith with her love of the outdoors and social justice. She was asked by Joan Dorner to fill. Uh, for him at this uh, at the Archdiocese of um, Ottawa and Cornwall when he became ill. She is currently coordinator for the care for creation at the Archdiocese of Ottawa and Cornwall, applying uh, herself to make a difference. Uh, thank you all for being here. We're truly blessed uh, to have you and to have the chance to listen to your wisdom and contributions today. We will take uh, questions at the end of the session. So please feel free to jot down your questions or share them in the chat and we'll have the chance to answer them at the end. Now, without further ado, uh, let's do what you are all here for and begin the webinar uh, uh, and begin tonight's enriching discussion with a short video on the apostolic exhortation. You have to go out and go back. Praise yeah. to be to God. Uh, We'll pass it on to Michael. Turn down this to Simon, please. To the powerful I ask, why do you want to preserve a power that will be remembered for its inability to stop the climate crisis when it was urgent and necessary? Today, a single generation can experience the acceleration of global warming. We are not talking about centuries or millennia, but just a few years. We do not have to look far to find the cause. It is us. 
How are we going to take care of our common home if we conform to the logic of maximum profit at the lowest cost? This logic gives power to a few and contributes to the fact that the most disadvantaged suffer especially the consequences of climate change. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis already addressed the consequences of the process of environmental degradation. Over these eight years, the planet has continued to suffer from our attacks. Behind this lack of an effective response, there is a technocratic paradigm that starts from the idea that human beings can expand without any limits their power thanks to technology. If we do not break out of this technocratic paradigm, we will isolate ourselves from the world around us, in which God has united us all. To change this trend, multilateral agreements among states are essential. It is necessary that world organizations have a real authority to ensure that the objectives set out in them are achieved. This has not been the case up to now because the damage to the planet has already been done, but we still have time to prevent it from becoming greater. The COP28 of the United Nations to be held in Dubai must be a turning point. This conference must produce agreements for the energy transition that are efficient, binding, and easy to monitor. Let us act. Let us accept the invitation of Pope Francis to walk together on a path of reconciliation with the world in which we live and to beautify it with the contribution of each one of us. This message, which the Pope has entitled, Praise God, reminds us that human beings who pretend to take the place of God become the worst danger to themselves. one powerful message to begin with. Without further ado, we'll pass it over to our first speaker, Dean. Thanks, Mario. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. Um, always great to start speaking with some real angelic music behind you. So uh, good to have a, a good vibe at the end of that video. Uh, I hope that what you got out of um, the Dicastery for Integral Developments video on La Data Dam is the sense that Pope Francis is talking prophetically. And in my role at Development and Peace, which is a, a Catholic solidarity movement, we try to think really hard about what does it mean to have that kind of prophetic faith in the public sphere. And my job here at DMP is a research and advocacy uh, officer and uh, an, an exhortation like La Date Deum is kind of exactly what we look for at Development and Peace. Maybe it's not perfect, maybe there's some extra things we want to see, but it's a way of rooting our, our advocacy, our action in a theological uh, imagination in our faith. So uh, my responsibility, along with Joe in this webinar, is to think through some of those theological pieces of La Date Deum. And as I was reflecting on that, that job and that task, uh, I thought about the title of this exhortation, La Date Deum, which translates to praise God. When I think about that kind of title, I often also think in terms of the climate crisis about the kinds of situations that I feel make it somewhat difficult to, to say that title. For instance, you know, when I think of something like a garbage dump, like this image that I've chosen for this uh, slideshow, I feel like it's actually very difficult to say praise God when you're faced with um, what I think is kind of a, you know, a bit of an, an anxiety inducing image, or at least it is for me. Uh, and usually at DMP, I like to have a bit more of a dialogical relationship with folks in a workshop instead of just having people listen. And in a monological uh, format like a webinar, it's hard to do that. But I want to invite you to maybe just survey this image a little bit with me. Um, so I'll talk it through, but you can maybe think about how it might hit you or impact you as well. Uh, when I look at an image like this, there are a lot of objects that kind of you can maybe pull out in a more direct way. For example, there is maybe part of an old tire uh, here kind of foregrounded. There is a lot of what looks like, to me anyway, kind of construction waste, stuff that doesn't look like it's going to be 
put to good use. And in fact, an environment like this even feels a bit sort of hostile, like maybe I don't belong in it as a human being. Um, you know, it's a bit dangerous. It makes me feel like you wouldn't want to get cut on any of these kinds of objects. Um, there's almost a, a bit of an underlying violence to it. And one thing that I've appreciated about Pope Francis's words about the environment is I think he's trying to get us in touch with these kinds of scenes that uh, I think are somewhat anxiety inducing to try to think through, are there resources in our Christian tradition to engage this situation in an honest way, really thinking through what's happening in the climate crisis? Uh, and one thing I like about Pope Francis is that he has really recovered what in the Catholic Church we refer to as the Franciscan tradition. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi is a pretty popular saint. People tend to know him more than maybe some other saints, but I, I like that Pope Francis has tried to really get us into what's radical about the Franciscan tradition in a moment when the world is becoming, uh, as he says in Laudato Si, uh, it's looking like an immense pile of filth in certain parts. So what does that mean, the Franciscan tradition? First of all, Pope Francis chose St. Francis of Assisi as his papal namesake. He's named after him. Uh, and there's lots of kind of echoes of Francis. Uh, La Date Dam, for example, was released this year on October 4th, which is the feast day of St. Francis. And La Date C and La Date Dam are both inspired by that ecological vision that we get in St. Francis. And just to give you kind of an idea of what makes that spirituality unique or interesting, I thought I'd share just a, a little section of what's called the Canticle of the Creatures written by St. Francis. As Pope Francis tells us in La Date Deum, this canticle was written by St. Francis late in his life. In fact, he was losing his sight. And so he has these rich, powerful images of creation, even as he's losing his ability to, to see those creatures. And I'll read just the first couple of lines here to give you an idea. St. Francis writes, Praise be you, my Lord, through Brother Wind and through the air, cloudy and serene, and every kind of weather through whom you give sustenance to your creatures. Praised be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, who is very useful and humble and precious and chaste. And many other images kind of appear that are similar to that in this canticle. There's Brother Fire, there's Sister Mother Earth. There are many, many others, even Sister Bodily Death in the, the wider canticle. And what St. Francis kind of invites us to do is to see creation as a, a, a family, as a sibling or a collection of siblings. And it's difficult, at least for me, to imagine that kind of spirituality when I consider the image I started with here, right, a, a garbage dump. It's difficult to, to think of uh, an, a discarded tire as somehow being in any kind of familial relationship to me. But I think that's the challenge that St. Francis and Pope Francis are actually giving to us. And when we start thinking that way, we can also, uh, it, it sort of suggests what some of the disconnects are. For instance, in La Data Deum, Pope Francis writes, some effects of the climate crisis are already irreversible, at least for several hundred years. Ocean waters have a thermal inertia and centuries are needed to normalize their temperature and salinity, which affects the survival of many, many species. This is one of the many signs that the other creatures of this world have stopped being our companions along the way and have become instead our victims, which I think is a pretty powerful image, right? St. Francis is trying to suggest we have this family relationship to creation, to other species, but the climate crisis is turning that relationship into one of oppressor and oppressed or victims. So the big question for me, I guess, is, is what can theology do in such a situation? And Pope Francis gives us some advice. Uh, he says, first of all, it's not just about kind of repeating our, our doctrines or maybe repeating them in the same way that is. In Laudato Si, he says, theological and philosophical reflections on the situation of humanity and the world can sound tiresome and abstract unless they're grounded in a fresh analysis of our present situation, which is in many ways unprecedented in the history of humanity. So we can find resources in our tradition based on a fresh analysis of that present situation. Pope Francis is also taking a prophetic stance. He's trying to help us imagine a different or peaceful relationship to creation. So to illustrate that, I've chosen this painting here, Peaceable Kingdom by John August Swanson, that sort of illustrates what a different relationship to creation might be like 
you know, we have these biblical ideas of the lion laying down with the lamb, for example. Uh, and an image like this suggests to me something very different from the world we have now, right? It's very colorful. There are There's a kind of coexistence among creatures. And what Pope Francis is, is suggesting is maybe our kind of theological language and tradition could help us recognize the gap between that vision of creation as it ought to be and the, the world as we're currently making it. And one thing we might say is theology and contempl contemplation should spur us into action. And Laudate Deum demonstrates that it's actually okay even to be impatient with the powers that be, as we saw in that video. Uh, Pope Francis is calling us to form global networks of solidarity in light of the failures of political leadership. And I think that's solidarity between people for sure, but also solidarity with other members of creation, with animals and plants and rocks and discarded tires and so on. And I think that is the challenge that we get uh, in that Franciscan vision. So I'll kind of close on this note before I pass the baton to uh, my friend Joe here. But something I really like about Pope Francis is he's often giving us invitations. He doesn't have a very kind of commanding presence, maybe for better and for worse. Sometimes I feel like he should be a little more commanding, but it's a spiritual discipline to receive that invitation in a confident way. Uh, Pope Francis is inviting all people who care for the climate to explore how to build societies that care for our common home. And I think that's a pretty tough invitation to receive uh, when we look around at headlines about the climate crisis. Both these documents, Laudato Si and Laudate Deum, they, they don't have all the answers. And Pope Francis is actually very honest about that. Instead, they invite us to work together to reflect on Pope Francis's vision and try to see what's pushing us forward in that vision, but also what's left out of it. How else can we maybe deepen our kinship with creation? How can we deepen our analysis of that situation. And uh, I think that's really what a panel like this is for, is to try to discover what is it in something like an apostolic exhortation that we can pick up, take with us, identify what work needs to be done and what tools do we have available to do it. So with that, Joe, I'm gonna give you that very tough task of, uh, of helping us uh, move into to that space. Dean, Dean mentioned that he likes to follow uh, angelic music, and I like to follow an angel like Dean. So in six minutes, I'm going to tell you what's uh, an encyclical, what's an apostolic exhortation, and what's in this particular one. So to begin with, you hear this word encyclical. Dean mentioned the uh, Laudato Si, which was released in 2015 uh, in May. Uh, an encyclical is really an, a circular letter that was usually originally sent to bishops of the world. But in our lifetimes, these encyclicals are, are actually addressed to all people of goodwill. And so they, they have a broader audience, if you, if you will. Uh, an apostolic exhortation, that is Laudate Deum, which was released uh, just a few weeks ago, as you heard. An apostolic exhortation is really a smaller letter. It's about 10 pages. If you were to print the encyclical from 2015, it'd be about 100 pages. Uh, An apostolic exhortation is about the third magisterial document from the leader of the Catholic Church. Uh, apostolic constitutions are the most important, then encyclicals, and finally these exhortations, which are usually messages that come across on a particular virtue or a particular uh, activity. So here we have Francis deciding that before COP28, which is on right now in Dubai, that he would address the climate crisis on this. And uh, you can see why this becomes important. If Laudato Si was the first encyclical on, uh, on the theme of environment, this particular uh, exhortation is quite uh, directed to the COP that is going on right now. Uh, Laudato Si follows that encyclical, follows a tradition of what we call Catholic social thought, which really started in 1891. Uh, but this was, as I say, the first one on the ecology. So what's in Laudate Deum? What's in the most recent exhortation? There are five things that I'm going to mention. Uh, first of all, the Pope decided that since Laudato Si, released in 2015, he would focus on the, uh, the Paris Accord from 2015 and update it to now going into COP28. Uh, 
So what we really see is that he says the climate science has changed and we have a situation where much more urgency for action is required. And he actually spends a lot of time, he spends nine paragraphs in section four, criticizing the lack of progress at these international meetings. The one this year uh, might have up to 90, 100,000 people attending it, for example. Uh, the second thing that uh, you might find interesting in Lerate Deum is that he spends a lot of time talking about North America. The Pope, as you might know, is criticized by traditional people in the church and outside the church. So here in number 14, I'll read a quote. He says, I feel obliged to make these clarifications on climate issues, which may appear obvious because of certain dismissive and scarcely reasonable opinions that I encounter even within the Catholic Church. So he's self-critical and he mentions that even his own church is not walking the talk as we might. I, I also want to mention that another thing Francis sees is that he does not reject politics. He actually embraces politics. In spite of being critical of these international meetings and the lack of progress, he calls from, uh, in, in section number, oh, I guess it's 38. I want to get the exact number for you. In section number 38 of the Laudate Dem, he actually calls for a multilateralism from below. In other words, it's important to have these heads of state and others meeting at the cops, but we need people's movements to move our governments forward. And this follows, uh, I think, quite nicely into the fifth thing I want to identify in the document. Francis says, and I quote, effective solutions will not, will not come from individual actions alone. That's a number 69. In other words, we have to be active as a community. We have to be active in politics. And what the Pope goes on to say is we need to change national and international structures. What's not in Laudato Deum? I have six minutes, so I'm not going to tell you lots of things, but I want to mention two key things that are really uh, not in Laudato Deum. Uh, the first is in section 55, I'll quote, the Pope says, so the first thing I think is not in Laudate Deum is the word phase out. And you will see in the uh, COP negotiations going on right now that this meeting will be a failure if we don't call for the phase out of fossil fuel use around the world. That's what environmental groups are telling us. That's what the science of climate change is telling us. What does Francis say in number 55? He says the necessary transition towards clean energy sources such as wind and solar energy and the abandonment of fossil fuels. He doesn't use the word face out, but he says the abandonment of fossil fuels is not progressing at the necessary speed. Consequently, whatever is being done risks being seen only as a ploy to distract attention. So still we have strong language there for COP28. We could see uh, Stephen Guibault, our uh, environment and climate change minister, calling for, uh, he's promised that there will be uh, a cap on emissions uh, announced at this uh, at COP meeting. Uh, we'll see how far that goes. We've been waiting for that for two years already, of course. The second thing that's not in Laudate Deum is the word divestment. And this is where the rubber hits the road for those of us in Canada. Uh, that word doesn't appear in the text, but we know that faith communities are actually about one third of the groups that have already divested from any investments in fossil fuel companies or projects. And so you see Catholic universities that have divested. You see the bishops of Ireland. You see the bishops of the Philippines. Twelve of the 20 dioceses in the United Kingdom have already divested. Canadian religious congregations. Not one diocese in Canada has divested. Not one diocese in the United States of America has divested. So how can we bring Francis's mission home? You know, it's interesting to think that even before 2015, before Francis's encyclical on uh, Laudato Si, on the ecological crisis, the Catholic bishops of Canada had already spoken three times in three different pastoral letters on the environmental crisis. Did we read them? Do people know about them? Do you hear about them? Did we act on them? 
The first one written in on the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi in 2003, you can read it, and you can even hear the quote in Laudate, uh, uh, Laudato Si quoting the Canadian bishop's statement from that time. Now, we know Francis wasn't able to go to uh, Dubai, but he did give a message uh, in his absence, the Cardinal read it, and his statement called, it actually mentioned the need for the elimination of fossil fuels as one of the four steps for an ecological transition. He added that uh, question of the elimination of fossil fuels to the need for energy efficiency, for renewables, and to have uh, our lifestyles, uh, education and lifestyles, uh, so that we become less dependent on fossil fuels. We can all do this in Canada. We can all say, perhaps with Francis, no more fossil fuels. Amen. Thank you so much, Joe. And uh, I will start us uh, by talking about uh, Canada's domestic policy. So once again, um, hello and, and thank you very much, uh, Dean and Joe, for starting our gathering uh, with such uh, soul-enriching reflections. Um, I hope you can all uh, see the, uh, the slide. Yeah, here we go. Thank you very much, Michael, for sharing the slides. Um, okay, so uh, thanks, Joe uh, and Dean, for starting uh, our gathering with such soul-enriching reflections. I hate to be the one who transitions us from the Pope's hopeful and uplifting words to the disappointing realm of uh, policy, but I will, because I think it's crucial to situate ourselves within the historical context of the evolving fight against the climate crisis. And while we often focus on a single climate policy, I wanted to present you with a, a brief uh, and general overview of Canada's most significant domestic climate federal policies, or what I call Canada's climate policy mosaic at home. And I also have about five or six minutes, so I will try and be very brief. Next slide. In March 2022, um, next slide, please. In March 2022, Canada introduced the 2030 Emissions Reduction Plan, which serves as a roadmap for Canada to achieve a 40 to 45 percent reduction in national emissions below 2005 levels by the year 2030. The problem is that science is increasingly telling us and pointing to the fact that a 40 to 45 percent reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions is not enough and that we need to make up for lost time, which Canada is very much guilty of. And so CPJ and many other organizations are joining the Green Party in calling for uh, and advocating for a 45% reduction in 2025, so in two years, and a 60% reduction in 2030. This aims to introduce some interim targets, uh, um, again, between now and 2030, uh, and uh, interim measures to ensure that we keep the government accountable for their promises. Um, next slide. Another key component of this comprehensive uh, approach must be carbon pricing. So let's talk about the current carbon pricing framework. As of this year, the national price on carbon pollution is $65 per ton of greenhouse gas emission or CO2 equivalent. That will rise by only $15 every year to a max of $170 per ton uh, for CO2 equivalent in 2030. Provinces and territories can also implement their own price-based system, uh, although we know pro uh, some uh, provinces and premiers specifically are not equally keen on uh, um, fighting the climate. So the larger problem here, however, with the carbon pricing measure is that it depends too much on what the government calls price signals and too little on binding regulations and comprehensive regulations. Even the price signal that they claim to put out is not strong enough. For instance, why does it have to take until 2030 to start charging polluters the full price of pollution according to the government itself, which is $170? And contrary to what some political parties would want you to believe, the carbon pricing system is actually good for combating the current affordability crisis. If it's implemented correctly, it will impact the heaviest polluters the most and will generate public revenues that are needed to accelerate the fight for a healthy, livable, and equitable planet. 
And despite the fear mongering around this policy, the government of Canada has actually said in a statement recently that the carbon tax only contributed a negligible 0.15% to inflation. Next slide, please. Now over to the elusive uh, pollution cap, as uh, Joe just said. I say that because environmental NGOs and civil society organizations have been calling for a cap on oil and gas emissions for two years now, and we're still waiting, despite being promised to see a framework for the pollution cap before or during COP. So what is it? Canada is set to implement a cap on greenhouse gas emissions from its oil and gas sector by the end of this year, as uh, has been mentioned. The regulation is crucial as emissions from the sector have risen by nearly 20% from 2005 to 2019 and currently account for one quarter of Canada's total carbon footprint. The target for oil and gas emissions by 2030 is 31% reduction over 2005 levels. So, as you uh, can guess by now, what is the problem? The problem is that the economy-wide reduction target for the same period as we just mentioned is 45%, which is already inadequate. So now the most polluting sector in Canada, which is the fossil fuel sector, gets to enjoy smaller reductions in emissions than the rest of Canada's less polluting sectors, which is, in my opinion, first logic. We encourage you to call in uh, your MPs, send them letters, and visit their offices to let them know that if the oil and gas sector won't lead the way in cleaning this emissions mess that it has created and profited from, it should at the very least be subjected to the same rules and regulations that all of us have to follow. Next slide, please. The clean electricity regulations. The clean electricity regulations are aimed at achieving a net zero electrical grid by 2035. Uh, the promising part is that it's relatively comprehensive um, with adequate targets like the strong emission standard of 30 tons uh, of CO2 equivalent per gigawatt per uh, in an hour. But as you can guess, uh, the major problems persist. The clean electricity regulation carves considerable exceptions and loopholes for the oil and gas sector. The most notable of them is the end of prescribed life clause or provision which states that a gas powered energy plant is um, if it's commissioned by 2025, it can continue emitting greenhouse gases until 2045, which is a full 10 years past the regulation originally, uh, what the regulation originally uh, stipulates. And even if all the regulations are applied as intended, modeling by the David Suzuki Foundation, which we work closely with, shows that Canada's electricity sector will continue to emit 100 tons of unabated or unaccounted for greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And finally, there are no interim targets or measures during the coming decade. So the regulation currently expects Canada's electricity grid to turn net zero uh, overnight when 2035. Next slide, please. Um, COP15 and uh, on biodiversity. So that's it's called the twin COP. Uh, it's the least famous one. It's concerned with uh, biodiversity, and it was held in Montreal last year. And it actually represented a significant commitment by the international community to safeguard biodiversity and halt the loss of nature, which is intimately linked to the climate crisis. Perhaps the most significant and impactful outcome from this summit was the 30 by 30 target. It's known as the 30 by 30 target. It's a commitment to conserve 30% of uh, terrestrial, inland, water, uh, coastal, and marine areas by the year 2030. This conservation is to be achieved through ecologically representative, well-connected, and equitably governed systems of protected areas and other effective area-based cons uh, conservation measures. This target will help halt reserve nature loss, address key drivers of biodiversity loss, and support sustainable use of biodiversity. It includes additional objectives like restoring 30% of degraded ecosystems and reducing harm, the use of harmful substances. So what's our role as the faith communities in advancing climate justice through biodiversity? CPJ and many similar organizations believe that land back is a needed response to the calls for truth and reconciliation as well as, as the climate crisis. For instance, indigenous-led areas-based conservation initiatives could be an awesome tool to let indigenous people do what they did so well for millennia, which is steward the land and its non-human inhabitants. 
indigenous peoples are also recognized as key partners in this initiative. So that's a good step. Next slide, please. And the next slide, uh, uh, despite uh, uh, the temptation, I couldn't uh, not include it here, which is an example of not what to do. Uh, uh, I, what not to do is to continue spending billions of dollars on public money on the very cause of the climate crisis in the form of fossil fuel subsidies, instead of placing a windfall tax on the $38 billion of uh, oil and gas profit uh, last year. Um, so we will continue to renew our call to end fossil fuel. And last uh, um, but not least, and David, uh, sorry, Environmental Defense um, estimates that uh, the federal government has spent 19 billion in total in public financing on, on fossil fuel uh, and gas in 2022. And finally, um, next slide, please. And finally, a word of caution, despite uh, uh, taking longer time than I should, uh, I did want to talk about false climate solutions, nuclear and carbon capture and storage. Uh, and that's because they are gaining more traction than they should nowadays. Uh, nuclear is a false solution because what Ontario, what Canada has chose to invest in uh, as the small modular reactors are more expensive than renewable alternatives uh, like uh, solar and wind. And um, there are even more small modular reactions are even more expensive than traditional nuclear reactors. They're also more risky due to the risk of nuclear waste uh, and nuclear accidents, and they're very time consuming to build and can take years and uh, decades. Even. And finally, carbon capture and storage is even more dangerous false climate solution. It redirects billions in public funds from funding renewables to unproven solutions like carbon capture and storage. Uh, in Canada, carbon, uh, historical carbon capture and storage projects promise to capture 90% of carbon has proven to only capture 45% of the carbon, so about half of the promised amount of carbon capture. And uh, air capture facilities are unproven. Um, they were, they're not built on scale yet. They're clunky, expensive, uh, and too often the carbon captured from this process is used to extract even more fossil fuels that were previously in reach. So, uh, what do we do? I hope this left you with some frustrations, some questions, but also some hope that collective advocacy can and does do a difference. Um, uh, what, how do we keep building momentum together? Only together can we build the needed momentum to truly achieve the spirit of a just transition towards a more sustainable and greener economy where we can leave absolutely no one behind because climate change is not about policies only. It's not only about emissions or dollar figures, it is about people like you and me and the billions of people in the global south uh, who may never, uh, and future generations, who may never get to experience the full beauty of creation as God intended it to be. Apologies for taking longer and I will pass it over to Ben. Great, thank you, Mario. Um, uh... I'm going to now pivot us and outline some of the key areas of international cooperation that many people have been calling for, including Kairos Canada and other organizations represented here tonight to accelerate action on climate change while ensuring, um, as Mario says, that no one is left behind. And we see that Pope Francis, in his way, is calling us to these actions as well in Ladao to do them. When we think about where our advocacy efforts uh, might be most strategic uh, at the local, national, or international level, I'm reminded that we we need all interventions everywhere all at once. So um, whether you feel called to act locally uh, or to kind of put your efforts into national or international advocacy, advocacy it's all needed. Um, Many people are losing faith in the international cooperation space uh, connected to climate change, such as COP, um, which is, as we know, on, going on right now, and uh, losing faith in, in that it can actually bring about change. And there's good reasons for this. Uh, the space has been co-opted by corporate interests. Um, some have likened it to a trade show. Uh, fossil fuel lobbyists are being given uh, seats at the table as part of Canada's official delegation. 
Uh, the COP president this year is a, an oil baron and, and came out and said that there is no science behind the call for fossil fuel phase out, which is just categorically untrue. And, um, and, and the list goes on. In Laudate Duum, the Pope expresses his concerns too about, about this space, um, but seems to remain hopeful about the conference. He says, if we are confident in the capacity of human beings to transcend their petty interests and to think in bigger terms, we can keep hoping that COP28 will allow for decisive acceleration of energy transition. This conference can represent a change of direction. And where I see hope in this process is uh, with, with leaders in the global south, indigenous peoples, civil society, unions, and faith communities, and others who are working to balance corporate interests at COP28 and, and drive ambition forward. The Pope, uh, oh, apologies, I'm not sure why my camera did that. Um, the Pope rightly names what uh, all of the groups uh, I just named have been calling for too, um, and which has been missing from global agreements such as the Paris Agreement, uh, which is fossil fuels. Uh, Laudati Duum, he, he writes, the, and as, as Joe pointed out, the abandonment of fossil fuels is not progressing at the necessary speed. Um, I, I appreciate the, his, the Pope's, uh, Pope Francis's affirmation of the urgency that we are hearing from scientists. Um, I'm not sure how else scientists or the scientific communi community can communicate urgency in a way that will activate world leaders. Um, so if the message comes from multiple sources, um, hopefully it can allow us to start moving more quickly. Simon Steele, the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change General Secretary, uh, said in his opening remarks at COP28 last week that we must teach climate action to run. And these are the three areas where I think we can pick up speed um, in international cooperation. So the first is fossil fuel phase out, or as Pope Francis named it, the abandonment of fossil fuels. Uh, as Joe mentioned, there is this, this really significant possibility at COP28 for the conference's formal decision to finally name the need for a just transition away from oil, gas, and coal. And this is huge. Um, the executive director of Climate Action Network Canada, Caroline Bruyère, says this can send a political signal that is essential to keep within that 1.5 degree threshold um, uh, and to keep that threshold alive for our planet. So this moment has been building thanks to mounting pressure from the people, from people in the global south, uh, from social movements, from the climate movement, and it's necessary for this to be named in the COP decision. And I believe there's also merit in calls for things like the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, another mouthful of a term, uh, to support this work. And, and we are seeing lots of momentum building around that initiative, especially in this past year. Uh, the president of Colombia signed on to this treaty initiative at COP. Um, the state of California has endorsed it. Uh, the World Council of Churches has uh, signed on. The Pope had, has already supported um, the treaty initiative. And so I encourage everyone to learn more about the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and we can share that link with you. And just to keep the conversation about fossil fuel phase out alive in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, it's a really important and difficult conversation um, to have, especially as Canadians uh, in, a, in a, an energy dependent uh, economy as we are right now. The second area of acceleration is for climate finance to support those most impacted by climate change, um, including countries in the global south, as well as indigenous peoples. So wealthy countries are not committing the level of funds that will keep pace with the mitigation and adaptation needs in the global south. High, emission, high emitting countries uh, such as Canada need to recognize the wealth that we've been able to, um, to accumulate as a result of, of having higher emissions and the need for us to return some of that wealth to the communities that are experiencing the worst of climate change impacts. So the return of that wealth is another kind of area of climate finance called loss and damage funding. And the Pope speaks about the idea of ec ecological debt in Laudate Duum. Um, and this concept is widely held uh, in the Global South too, along with the ideas of reparation. There was promising commitments around loss and damage funding announced on the first day of COP28 last week, 
but much remains to see to be seen as to how this fund will be administered effectively to ensure that there are equitable outcomes and that um, the funding does actually get to the people who need it most. Um, as well, not enough commitment and recognition is being given on the global stage to Indigenous communities. Um, that rec the recognition that they are among the most impacted by climate change. So more work needs to be done to uphold Indigenous sovereignty at the global level um, in these global this global cooperation space and support uh, mitigation and adaptation needs of Indigenous communities as well as funding for loss and damage. Um, I encourage you to read a, 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 a recent report that was published by Kairos Canada called Addressing Ecological Debt equity and justice for climate related loss and damage to learn more about this issue and then encourage you to uh, send uh, a letter to the Minister of International Development with some of the recommendations in that report um, to call on Canada to increase its climate finance commitments. The final area of acceleration, of acceleration that I'll mention is around global debt cancellation. Debt relief should be given should be a given for countries in the global south uh, in order to give them the space and focus to, for to make investments that will improve the natural environment and the well-being and livelihoods of their people. Um, this is a benefit to us all. The Pope speaks about this idea too in Laudate Duum. He says it would only be fair to find suitable means of remitting the financial debts that burden different peoples, not least in light of the eco ecological debt that they are owed. Uh, there are many ways for us to support global calls for debt justice and debt cancellation and a wealth of experience in the ecumenical community to be taken from uh, the Jubilee campaign um, to support that effort. I'll just end with one uh, final quote from Laudati Duum, uh, which uh, could serve as perhaps um, a bit of a charge or as, as Dean um, mentioned, it's a, an invitation to be kind of received confidently um, or at least maybe it's something to remind our world leaders who hold the power to make these plant saving decisions. And that is we must move beyond the mentality of appearing to be concerned, but not having the courage needed to produce substantial changes. So let's hope um, results of this year's COP uh, kind of lead us in a better direction. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I'm going to pass it on to Agnes to bring us down to the local level. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to take a minute and screen share. Okay. All right. So I am talking about um, a very specific portion of La Daute Deum. And I am going to begin with a quote again from the um, Apostolic Exhortation. Pope Francis says, the demands that rise up from below throughout the world where activists from very different countries help and support one another can end up pressuring the sources of power. It is hoped that this will happen with respect to the climate crisis. In a recent webinar on Laudate Deum, Dr. Chris Rickno expressed his conviction that our location in the natural world matters. Our personal responses to geographic place, and there are many, um, across Canada um, are of great importance and our human experience would be incomprehensible and meaningless without nature, without the environment that we are part of. We need to reconnect our personal and society, um, our sociological imagination with the natural world to be authentically human. He reminds us that in the um, uh, Exhortation, Pope Francis names an important role for heartfelt religion on the level of transfiguration to animate the necessary moral movement that is not only personal, but also political towards being in transformative relationships with other human beings and with the rest of creation. The Laudato Si movement statement to Canada's negotiators at COP28 in light of Laudato Deum stated, Canada continues to have an outsized impact on the climate crisis, particularly through regulations and policies around deforestation, mining and fossil fuel extraction, both within and beyond Canada. Instead, we must first and foremost 
increase our greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. Both Joe and Beth have, have spoken to this, and so has Mario very eloquently. Um, but um, you know, Pope Francis reminds us that the necessary transition is towards clean energy sources, such as wind and solar, and abandonment, already noted, of fossil fuels is not progressing at the necessary speed. Genevieve Gallant from the Office of Religious Congregations for Integral Ecology observed that we need legislation. We are the ones that need limits. And she questions, do we trust that our banks and pension plan managers will divest from fossil fuels? Do we trust that COP28 meetings in the United Arab Emirates will be fruitful and just? What are the campaigns and who are the organizations, the churches and faith communities that we can support who are putting life before profit? We need to work together, stand as citizens taking action because it is absolutely necessary that we do so. Excellent examples of the type of multilateralism from below that Pope Francis speaks of is demonstrated in the global Laudato Si movement and in our Canadian chapter with our eco investment accelerator tools that are available for anyone to use. Development Peace Canada <clears throat> has their um, stand for the land campaign and the Indigenous Climate Action Network also has much to say about solutions to the climate crisis. In Canada and internationally, there is Kairos and locally the For the Love of Creation organization that has helped sponsor this webinar. Faith in the Common Good in cooperation with the United Church of Canada has a Faithful Footprints program that um, supports retrofits in faith buildings so that they use less carbon and they are more energy efficient and cost efficient. And there are many, many examples of religious communities like the Sisters of St. Joseph's Blue communities that are protecting uh, water. Arosha looks at um, um, uh, environmental stewardship from many points of view. And there are many um, uh, faith communities that are looking at uh, transitioning both their own practices and educating their own people on, uh, on um, environmental uh, conservation. What I want to say in terms of multilateralism from below is that we, we are those activists that Pope Francis is placing his hope in. In a webinar series from the Indigenous Climate Action Network, the colonial urge to commodify the climate crisis was the title. Members of Turtle Island and Indigenous communities critique the UN conference processes and offer solutions. Ariel Chekwi Derenje, uh, is the uh, Indigenous Climate Action Network's executive director. And she stated, Indigenous communities have long been calling attention to solutions driven by our ancestral wisdom and our relationships with our traditional lands and waterways. Our solutions expose the fallacy of colonial logic that consistently speaks to reducing the climate crisis to an economic crisis only, and thereby primarily benefiting corporations and colonial governments. Rather, she suggests solutions should be looked for as a life relational challenge rooted in the interconnected relationships that we have with the natural world. And in this, Pope Francis and indigenous communities are echoing each other. They're saying the same thing. Our priorities in Canada should be to ensure that our wealth is not invested in industries that are actively and aggressively destroying creation and those people who are working to protect it. Divesting financial assets from fossil fuel companies is a first step. Our own personal pensions, the pension plans of our unions, and even, um, even our government. Um, and then also um, how our um, institutional assets are invested. Once that step is taken care of, we should press for regulation for, the co for corporations and financial institutions to follow. So uh, I, re I renew some of the calls to action that the Laudato Si movement has stated lately. Uh, and that is one that Beth has mentioned. Did you know that the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty has a specific page for faith endorsements? And it is um, one that I invite everyone to look up and, and put their own individual name in and then invite your communities to also sign on as um, organizations. 
The Laudato Si movement in Canada has begun a letter writing campaign to our faith leaders um, with model letters asking them to divest pension plans and diocesan financial assets from fossil fuels and then courageously make their divestments public so that they are also then reducing the moral um, license um, to continue financing these um, businesses. And then also learn what we can about climate solutions led by Indigenous peoples through the Indigenous Climate Action Network, their webinar series, and Indigenous leadership initiatives. These things will be shared with you as links um, uh, in a follow-up uh, if you aren't able to capture them here. And thank you very much. I'm now going to pass it um, to, to others to bring even a, a more granular look at local activities. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, and uh, uh, and thank you to all those who have uh, presented uh, before me. Um, I'm just going to uh, share this if I can. Again, I want to thank you, those of you who who presented this evening. I've been uh, listening uh, with uh, great uh, interest and intent, and I've been. Uh, looking to see the, what we at uh, Galilee Center or retreat centers across the country can discern about what we are called to in response to this urgent moment, which is of course marked by the Holy Father's exhortation, Laudate Deum and the COP28, and most recently the Pope's message to the Faith Pavilion at COP28 this past weekend. Galilee Center is, of course, only one of a multitude of local faith organizations trying to identify the challenge of this moment and to respond according to our particular charism. What is new in this moment for us is most clearly the call to multilateralism from below. Retreat centers have, in some ways, been a privileged place when it comes to responding to the environmental challenge. Galilee, for example, is situated on 35 acres of, of land, which is, includes pristine forest, walking paths, waterfront, beautiful vistas, all of which together provides a beautiful oasis for people seeking to retreat and be in touch with our environment. Uh, this reality also presents us with the challenge to care for this corner of creation in a way that is not only sustainable, but also serves the people in this moment. We strive uh, to advance spiritual, religious, and peaceful coexistence among peoples of all faiths or no, no faith through retreats, educational workshops, and events such as these, uh, this one this evening, which we're very pleased to have the opportunity to support. We also um, advance ecological projects around sustainable living and care for the planet, including but not limited to clean water initiatives, recycling, and reforestation. As a retreat center, we are privileged to have a charism which aligns with the contemplative theme of Francis's exhortation. As recently as Saturday and his address to the Faith Pavilion at COP28, Francis emphasized again the need for contemplative practice, saying a world poor in contemplation will be a world polluted in soul a world that will continue to discard people and produce waste. It is an essential obligation for religions, he said, which are called to teach contemplation, since creation is not only an ecosystem to preserve, it is also a gift to embrace. Our challenge, consistent with the challenge in Laudato Si, will be to ground our contemplative practice ever more deeply in echo spirituality. In an effort to respond to Laudato Si, we have increased our efforts to link with the community in sustainable projects. People are discovering that our land, our land is not a cut off private reserve or sanctuary, but is open to the public and those, and even those who may never walk through our doors. At retreat centers, like Galilee, people are free to walk through the forest grove, sit and 
contemplate on the beaches, walk in our restored labyrinth, 26 community gardens where people in the community can practice organic gardening, raised bed senior gardens, uh, a hope garden uh, providing food for the food bank, a reminiscence garden in, in uh, cooperation with the um, uh, Alzheimer's Society, and of course, a peace garden at which people gather a couple of times each year. It is time for our next steps, more link, clearly linking our contemplative practice with action and partnering, partnering with the civil society movements that are building multilateralism from below. We are focusing this year on two initiatives currently. We have assured that we are not linked through our investments to any fossil fuels and have joined with the Laudato Si Movement's divestment campaign to go public with our commitment to make our choice to, of, of divestment known and to encourage others to, and perhaps even possibly embarrass others who have been not uh, prepared to step up in that way. We are also in the process of becoming a blue community, community joining with the movement initiated by the Council of Canadians and committing to the pledges involved there, promoting care for our water as a community common. We are a small uh, retreat center, um, making modest uh, initiatives as they open up to us. We remain open to engaging in new ways, particularly in ways that were brought forward to us this evening. Even as they are small, we hope to, be, to continue to contribute to the groundswell of a growing and hopeful movement. Thank you. And now I'll pass it on to Mireille. Yes, good evening. So I'm coming from another uh, uh, smaller organization, which is a, an organization, we have to qualify that, <clears throat> the Archdiocese of Ottawa, Cornwall. And what I was asked was to share with you some stories and impacts on the very local level of what we are attempting to do. So if we look at the Care for Creation Ministry, of which I'm the uh, coordinator, um, I like to play on different layers, and this is what uh, shows, according to uh, the Laudato Si message, that we are all interconnected. And I appeal to uh, different um, groups of people that might be drawn to the archdiocese from whichever entry point uh, through their Catholic faith. And there, um, so this is the uh, web page in progress, if you will, uh, through my Catholic faith, pointing to, uh, from the start, Paul, uh, uh, Pope Paul VI first had some very strong uh, statements, then to John Paul II, and then even Pope Benedict, who changed the Vatican to become uh, carbon neutral. So we want to make those links with the scriptures as well, with the very uh, words in the uh, ritual, in the liturgy, every uh, mass. So it, that's very important from the point of view of the faithful coming in and being very judgmental of this is an activist environmental thing. No, it's not. We have to come in through our, our Canadian experience, which is uh, an experience of privilege. We are spoiled with water, with land, and we have to realize that we are rich and we, uh, we have to uh, become a little bit more humble and uh, appreciate uh, that this is not the situation uh, of the rest of the world. I like to uh, look at the, uh, the care for creation from the indigenous perspective as well and relying on some of the teachings, uh, most of the teachings of the indigenous people with respect to the land and the gratitude and the awe and wonder before creation. And then through the lens of social justice. So if these entry points didn't appeal to any of our uh, people, well then do it for uh, love of your neighbor. 
So the care of creation vision here is uh, to point to the fact that living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It's not an option. It's not a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. Not to point to the fact that it is sinful if some people need to have that, but it is uh, very important to our, our life of faith. So I want to play on three different um, level in my approach to trying to draw uh, care for creation in the life of the faithful. Number one is in terms of education and to raise awareness. Second one, to create opportunities for gratitude. Uh, and finally, take action and mobilize people in parish communities to make changes to their lifestyles and our society. Uh, in the view of Monseigneur Marcel Danfus, our Archbishop, he believes uh, more in the osmosis and not in the, the uh, top down. And if we are talking about the multilateralism from below, that's exactly what we're talking about, the osmosis. But I strongly believe that as a group, we have to be modeling as well. So just a few examples, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm just gonna be brief and then show you a couple of pictures. You might uh, recognize some of them. Uh, we started the John Dorner Care for Creation Award. Um, we have a definite presence with the youth in the Conseil Scolaire de District Catholique de l'Est Ontarien and local parishes. There are some Laudato Si action groups right now, one on indigenous and one on water. And these groups are being called to work together more and more. In the showing the movie, the letter is also a great education tool. It's very difficult to, to draw people to those, but uh, poco a poco. Uh, then there's the monthly messages to the parishes via a uh, Teams platform. So it could be either prayer intentions, that might be at the center of the Sunday service, which might appeal or draw attention to uh, COP28, for instance. Um, and then we have some special events that draw attention to creation and to also the need to respect and protect. So similarly, we have the uh, art show uh, that we had this year for the first time, special masses and homilies. Um, so this is just a picture of the first winner of our uh, John Dorner um, Care for Creation Award, a young lady who's in, been uh, spearheading a number of activities at the uh, school level. And this was presented by uh, John Dorner's wife, uh, Anna Dorner. And this was at the cathedral at a special mass for um, the season of creation. Many parishes have been inspired by you know, just sending them uh, either the uh, campaign from development and peace, uh, some some of the tools. So I'm making myself the uh, local distributor of all the think tank that we have this evening. And it's lovely to see at the parish level how it comes together. This is a presence in uh, different schools. Um, up there is lots of kids. Uh, uh, they were partying for Halloween, but we called it All Saints Day. And my role was to draw attention to uh, Care for Creation via a uh, Care for Creation rosary. Now, a second level is creating opportunities for gratitude, much like the Indigenous people. And we had a number of hiking uh, outings uh, featuring one of our um, priest who's uh, our vocation director, uh, Father Connor O'Hara. Uh, and uh, we've had wonder walks with a reflection attached to it. Uh, as you can see, there are small groups, but population changes. Uh, we're trying to encourage uh, people to come out, uh, bike rides and an art show. So uh, special masses this year were held on Earth Day at the diocese. Uh, for the season of creation at the um, cathedral and St. Francis of Assisi uh, feast day. Uh, we had the care for creation stations of the cross and mentioned the rosary with the youth group. So this is a, a brief picture of our um, poster for our uh, art show in the fall during the season of creation. And it was a, quite a huge success. We're hoping to have another one maybe around Earth Day this year drawing attention to our creation. It's David Suzuki, if I can uh, quote him, 
uh, saying, how can we expect people to protect nature if they've never been to nature? So we want to draw them out of their, uh, in front of their uh, computer and take them outside. Uh, and the third one, third level is to mobilize and take action. Well, obviously development in peace has been a great uh, inspiration and uh, we draw from their campaign, which are always very well articulated to draw signatures. Uh, this is how we can uh, be advocates for brothers and sisters, be it indigenous or those who are losing their land or um, having their, their water contaminated. Um, and then little actions like fundraising uh, through the sale of insulated water bottles has been a great uh, opener for the next item in our own parish. We develop a hosting protocol to limit waste in the parish hall by several uh, caterers who were brought in. And just recently, just uh, last few days, uh, we were able to purchase a food cycler for the diocesan offices. So when we are not a resident, it's very difficult for us to use the uh, green bin. And obviously for me, it's a little action that will go far because methane is also a great uh, greenhouse uh, gases emitter. So we want to tackle it at the ground level as well. So the food cycler acts like a mini composter uh, with electricity. And I've been involved also with a couple of um, uh, partnerships uh, to plant trees in local churches. So talking about advocacy, when we were uh, trying to support Bill C-262, a private member's bill uh, on due diligence for um, extracting companies who are not respecting human rights or land uh, where they go and uh, want to make profit. This is a sample of our Holy Redeemer Parish uh, creation care guidelines. And so uh, we are just, this is the poster that's in the kitchen, uh, as simple as that. And I wish to use a little bit like uh, the osmosis tool to extend it to all the diocese. If everybody starts to change their ways, I used to say to my kids, even if you don't have all that much power, the power of your dollar, where you spend your money, uh, indicates to uh, the market uh, where they have to change. So we're trying to change. This is a picture of the food cycler, and this is a picture of the waste uh, that I was able to retrieve from the regular garbage that should be organically uh, uh, processed. New pilot projects. So this is on my Santa's list, uh, installing solar panels at a parish or heat pump. So we're working on that. Uh, apparently, we should be in a position to have a carbon zero church building in Cumberland. So right now it's at the uh, plan level, but it's supposed to materialize in the next three years. And these are the two partnerships that I've been working on. The tiny forest project with Ecology Ottawa. So in the past few years, Ecology Ottawa uh, had funding to uh, distribute a small uh, saplings that we would distribute. So we would converge on a, in a church parking lot, have Ecology Ottawa come and distribute like their 300 saplings. We would have a priest come and bless the uh, saplings and distribute it uh, to all the population. So we're being uh, good neighbors. Uh, so the tiny forest project now is taking over and we were able to put in the uh, request for that subsidy. And the tiny forest concept is to take a surface of uh, 30 by 30 square feet uh, to plant uh, native species of trees and to maintain it with Ecology Ottawa's uh, support to grow into a mini forest. So uh, our request has gone in as of last Friday. So. Um, we have to cross our fingers. Um, one of our parishes, I notice uh, Margaret Bott is, is online tonight. Uh, their parish has been able to put in a request uh, for uh, some forests, uh, so, some trees uh, to plant with Tree Canada. The major, the major challenges, and so I, I like to uh, um, complement with my own picture of what the, the, the climate uh, change is doing here. Uh, so the challenges are many, and I would say first and foremost is the post-pandemic state of rebuilding 
the community of the faithful. So, so right now, this is the focus of all the priests in their different congregations. Um, obviously, there is the traditionalist view of Pope Francis, uh, who is rocking the boat. So that is affecting as well uh, how we can uh, invite um, people to join in the movement at the local level. Obviously, the lack of volunteers flows from A and B. Uh, communications. It's been a real big challenge at the archdiocese level. Um, over the last year and a half, we hired and then lost uh, communications directors. So now we have to make do with a system that is halfway built. So this has been a, a thorn, uh, definitely. Um, right now, we lost uh, an English-speaking youth coordinator at the Archdiocese. So on the French side of the house, the youth coordinator is doing quite a bit in the high schools. Uh, but on the English side, it's a uh, hit and miss. Obviously, the globalization of indifference includes our clergy, unfortunately, because of A, uh, they are not on board with uh, subscribing to um, what we need to do right now. So uh, that's very sad. So we're working on that, but it's going to be a while. And the last one is privilege, which goes with the globalization of indifference. But especially in Canada, we are very comfortable in our AC buildings. And uh, even when the weather is miserable, we're not suffering too much. So that's these are our challenges. And to finish off, I just wanted to leave you with a word of, uh, um, should I say, of encouragement. Um, the only thing we can do is continue to be a light or a spark. I, I'm speaking not for the organization. They do major work. But for the common folk like I am, uh, we want to be that light and that spark. And a spark can ignite. Um, this weekend at our church, we're going to have, we're going to follow with Beth uh, Lorimer's invitation to have the candlelight for COP. We're going to have a, a mini version of that in our own church with the youth uh, and young adults. So whatever we can do as a spark, we have to journey together. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for those uh, thoughtful contributions. And thank you um, for all the panelists for their thoughtful insights, the wealth of knowledge and uh, the faithful work that all of the panelists are engaged in. We are a better and stronger coalition because we have folks like you among our allies. I do not want um, to take away from the Q&A uh, portion. We have less than five minutes, but I also do want to give folks a chance to ask their questions. If you have a question, please uh, prepare it in your mind or share it on the chat. There is already one question shared on the chat, and it is related to divestment. Um, I'll direct that question perhaps to Jogan, and just to formulate that question a little bit more. Uh, how do we trace back our investments and, and where they end up? And how do we mobilize church uh, uh, congregations and faith communities to start divesting their institutional investments from fossil fuels to a more responsible investment? So I think there's uh, there's several ways to do that. It was uh, someone in the chat mentioned how difficult it was quite a few years ago, and that's absolutely true. But all of the financial institutions now have fossil free uh, instruments that you can ask for and transfer your investments uh, without charge to do that. Uh, trying to do these institutional uh, changes are perhaps a little more difficult. Uh, my suggestion is what we've done with some of the congregations. You create a space whereby the financial people from congregations that have already taken the steps have conversations with the financial people of other congregations. Sometimes the leadership aren't financial wizards, you know, but have the, the finance people talk to each other. So you have situations whereby sometimes groups have had to change their financial advisors because their advisor wasn't willing to move the investments. Other people were able to do it uh, very, very simply. Uh, the parish I'm part of was able to uh, divest without much difficulty uh, at all. So it, it really depends in each case. So I think that the thing to do is make available those kinds of people that have gone through the process 
to help with the technical side with those people that are maybe uh, starting off or finding it a little threatening. But it's uh, the, it, it, the, the situation is much, much easier than it was before. It's possible for all. And uh, you can look at the uh, Agnes's uh, website there, the Catholic uh, Eco Investing Accelerator tool, which has all kinds of information there. It's a very, very good tool. And I encourage people to be in touch with others that have uh, done it to learn as we all go forward. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And thank you for all of the vibrant discussions uh, on the chat. I invite you to uh, either speak out your questions or share them on the chat. We have uh, four more minutes. I see um, Chung Yang has po posed a question about uh, shareholder engagement. And um, there is, uh, many people are already working with SHARE, um, which is um, an organization that specifically helps um, uh, institutional investors uh, collaborate together and increase their voice at shareholder meetings and engagement um, to hold um, individual organization, uh, corporations and financial institutions um, to a set of ethical um, guidelines that, that um, we agree on. So in some cases, shareholder engagement works historically. There has been some Canadian companies where shareholder engagement, um, especially around um, um, uh, carbon has been successful, but by and large, the, the companies in Canada that are making the most profits have no interest in shareholder engagement. And that, I think that I can say that as well um, when it comes to the financial institutions. Most recently, uh, Indigenous people tried to speak to the Royal uh, Bank of Canada and um, they had a shareholder engagement spot when it came time to be there at the annual meeting. They were shunted off to another room down the hall and had to watch the proceedings on video and were not allowed to speak. So um, in some cases, there's aggressive opposition to having some voices be heard in shareholder engagement situations. So we have to, um, uh, I think, discern which companies are even going to um, respond to that. Some of them are actively uh, opposing shareholder engagement. So um, knowing that, we should choose where and how um, our engagement will have the most effect. And if it doesn't have effect, that's when we advocate for divestment because um, supporting those companies further is, is, is um, I don't think, a, a good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, Agnes. And thanks again for continuing to share the resources in the chat. Um, absent any other questions, I'll uh, touch base on the um, uh, nuclear piece uh, that was discussed in the chat. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but um, small modular reactors that are currently being approved and built in Ontario are more expensive than solar and wind, and especially offshore wind. Uh, they're even more expensive than traditional nuclear reactors. So we're uh, cost benefit analysis wise are better off building a traditional nuclear reactor than a small modular reactor. Again, the cost per unit of energy, it's risky because of nuclear waste and nuclear accidents. Uh, small modular reactors are not immune from that. And the reason why they're not immune from that, that we have nowhere else in the world where we have a functional commercially available uh, or uh, proven on scale SMR uh, that is working. Canada's will be the first in the world and uh, I, I from my perspective, I don't want to bet um, the future of uh, coming generations or my future for that regard on unproven technology. Um, why uh, in renewables are not being built at scale? Maybe it has something to do with the 19 uh, billion dollars in federal uh, subsidies to the fossil fuel sector. Um, I don't know, but it, it certainly they certainly are proven to be uh, the most cost effective option uh, for our current electricity grid. There are many other uh, options that we uh, can do, like increasing uh, 
uh, interconnectivity between uh, provincial grids um, and increasing our storage capacity on the grid uh, to be able to accommodate um, the base load. But um, I think nuclear would be a step backwards. Okay. In order to respect all of your time, I will close it here. Um, thank you again. As our webinar comes to a close, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to everyone who joined us tonight. Your presence and engagement in this important discussions are, are invaluable. Uh, once again, your continued engagement with our advocacy work, uh, with our advocacy for creation care, demonstrates to elected officials that faith communities do not only care about creation care, uh, um, uh, climate advocacy, but also are committed to taking significant climate action for the sake of our beautiful and only common home. Without your voices, our work uh, for advocating for a livable and sustainable future becomes much more challenging and even impossible. I also want to extend special thanks to our esteemed panelists for their insightful contributions and to all our partners who made this event possible. Thanks also for everyone who supported this event behind the scenes. And as I mentioned on the chat, all resources that are shared during this presentation will be forwarded to you in a follow-up email after this event. And uh, I will leave you with those words. Please remember that each of us has the power to make a difference in the, fight, in the fight for environmental justice and the care for our common home. Let's carry forward the spirit of Laude Diem in our daily lives. Uh, committing ourselves to actions that uphold the dignity of creation and our shared responsibility to protect God's creation. I encourage you to stay involved, stay informed, and most importantly, stay inspired by the Pope's words. Together, let's continue to advocate for a just and sustainable world for everyone, leaving no one behind, uh, guided by our faith and united in our purpose. Thank you once again for joining us. May uh, we all continue to find strength and hope in our collective efforts for a better world and good night and blessings on your journey. Thank you very much. Thank you.